Peace, peace, peace. Welcome to another episode of Wilds of Dome. Uh, today, I got a very, very special guest, man. It's my brother. Uh, he's a, a extremely talented writer. Um, he's written for all of the dope hip hop magazines when they were dope. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He's an author of, you know, several books. Um, he's a teacher at a law school in Mecca. Uh, Sunez Law, also known as Skiller Straight Low. I appreciate you for coming through, God. Peace of God. How you be? I'm good. I'm good. You know what I mean? I'm good. No doubt. No doubt. I appreciate you taking some time, man. So, yeah, let's talk about the books. You know what I'm saying? Before we get into. Oh, yeah, yeah, man. Um, this year I got two books. You know what I mean? Um, the When I wrote, I got them here with me, so I, I, I'll use visual display. When I wrote this one, Filtered mm -hmm. Real Essays from the Invisible Renaissance, what I was doing was. I had written about this entire musical, you know, resurgence for the last 10 years. And, and around 2012 is when I started to call what I was seeing in hip hop music as a renaissance. Mm -hmm. But as I left, it, it was 2012, I had left Spit Gems, Fuck the Radio album release party. And I was like, I might be the only one to see this shit, though. Mm -hmm. And I meant me as far as a, a, a journalist, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like really understand it and shit like that. Most of the journalists that were covering the era that were in major mags, though, that were covering that the, the underground like that, they were covering actually fashion. Oh, crazy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So they were covering like they were covering uh, um, low lives. They were covering things like that. But in, you know, trying to kick it with sneakers, things like that. But they weren't really capturing the music mm. and the filtered reel is basically selected essays that really and an analysis of the of the one of the last years of that renaissance 2018 to to show you how deep it got over the years you know what i mean mm -hmm. but then i i realized that artists started releasing so many albums you know how you like you know it's crazy yeah. Yeah, and yeah. around 2018 when it started i was realizing that in my catalog when i because i have a whole database you gotta have a database right and i was looking and i was like yo this is running up like i got 300 albums Next year, I got 400. And I'm not talking about ones that I don't like, you know, that I'll delete or something like that. I'm talking about ones that are great, good, respectable. Like, you know, I'm key, right. I keep all of those. You know, I'm a collector, so I keep the respectable too. You know what I mean? Right, right. And it was too much. And I said, like, I, um, I can't continue to write on it just in, like, magazine form because I'd be highlighting ones I like as opposed to uh, the whole universe. So I was like, you know what? That real love article I would write of the best records of the year, I want to make that a whole book. Mm. And I always hate it. I hate grades. Mm -hmm. I've got into issues with artists that I know, like I know for years, because they want like a, a you know, I'll you give you the like, equivalent. Like they want four like mics, a, they want mic five mics, it should be higher mics. Mm -hmm. And so I ditched all that years ago. You know what I'm saying? So that whole, this whole, since like the 2000s, I stopped. In my own personal stuff, I, I don't use grades. And I don't think music should be graded that way. Um, so when I was writing the reel, I always hated putting the, the best record of the year, second best, because it always has your bias and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it doesn't, in this case, if there's 500 worthy records, I don't know if everybody should go buy out all those records, even though I have them. But I think that people should know the whole universe so they could pick out what they like out of it, you know, mm -hmm. and really get an idea of everything. And I think that would be wonderful. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it would be something where you could defeat the algorithm. You know what I mean? Right. right. So a book to defeat the algorithm, I was like, you know what? I'm going to make these all. And I did it for 2020, but I only sold it as an ebook. So I added on more detail for 2021's records. Mm. And then I said, I'm going to put them all together. And I made this 400 page book, the reel of 2021 and 2020, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I wrote my ass off with this. I didn't know I could actually complete it, man. I really didn't know I could do it. God, it's um, it's an at first, it's an amazing collection of work. Um, because you know, it's like for one, we trust your music knowledge, right? And so, uh, some of these MCs we may not ever heard of, but you know, when you when you're reading through the book and you're like, okay. Well, I see what, oh, you know, and you have the breakdowns of the, either the album or the artist, right? And and so it makes you go, like, there's been several MCs that I may not have been hip to that just 
you right. don't skim through the book. You like I'll because I'll, it's not a book that you have to read from front to back. You can nah, nah. you can open Yo, that joint at one seventy five. I was, and I, was I, I had thought about the book a lot, like you know those old movie books, like Leonard Maltin's Movie Guide. Right, right. You know you're not reading every <laughs> single one, but like when you want to fuck with some romance movie, right. Which right. are the ones that he put in there and shit like yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah. there's nothing like this book. There's nothing out there. So it's the best introduction to everything. I have to miss things, God. Like mm-hmm. people release shit on their own. So I have to miss certain things. You know what right. I mean? Um, I'm also lucky that I can make a book like this because I'm at, honestly, I'm at the root of it. I'm at New York mm-hmm. and everything goes outward. So right. even if you said this region is better, like even if you, people get into arguments like that, you know what I mean? And you know, you know, I could get into my own. Right? <laughs> <I already> <laughs> but even if people had a region they said was better, they all come through New York, though. Mm, in right. other words, they all come and show and prove their shit to New York, you know, or they, you know, they'll boast and come through New York, whether peacefully or not peacefully. You know right, what I mean? Right. So I, I get to have the pulse of that. And honestly, what's crazy about the book is that I know most of these artists personally. Mm. Right. You know what I mean? So uh, it, it gives it a perspective where I'm telling you, I, I understand what they were making. Mm, you know right. what I'm saying? I understand what they were doing. And um, man, I'm just, uh, I'm just glad I was able to do it. Now I, I, I know I can do it. Mm. So I take, I, I'm doing it throughout the year. Right. You know right. What I'm so, you know, yeah, so, it's kind of like, <laughs> you're, not, you're not studying so, for the test the week of the test no more. Holy shit. It was, <laughs> they, oh God, it was like that. It was like that. I had like, you know, imagine, I, I imagine it like um, working at a perfume shop, mm. you know, like you work at a perfume shop mm. and you're like, man, I want to get a new cologne and shit, but my ears, my nose is dead right now. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I already know. You know what I'm <laughs> and it was like that with music. I had to use different genres. I had to mm. use other things. I, I, I'm very, I'm very stingy. God, I won't use silence though. <laughs> right. If yeah. I could play music somewhere, I'm going to play music. I, so I, silence is not an option. You know, I mean? wanted to ask you something you just mentioned. I, I find it very interesting because in this book, you don't do that. Like what made you get away from, because you remember, because even to this day, a lot of people in hip hop journalism and just fans and uh, people that talk, you know, music at a high level, they still use rating systems. Right. And so what made you for it to be so popular within the genre? What made you go away from? It? The reason I go away from rating systems. Right. First, it was because there was a lot of problems. People asking me for grades that don't mean shit. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, then the second thing was I want people to read what I'm doing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I made up a whole style of writing. Right. So I want people to read my shit and go through it. The other the other reason is this, is that. When you get up to classics and stuff, right? Like, yeah. like the one of the best examples, right? Grief, let's go. Reloaded Grief Pedigree, right? Mm-hmm. 2012 to me is such a banner year, you know what right. I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's one of the most important years in hip hop music history to me. And so let's get Reloaded and Grief Pedigree from Ka. The reason I picked those two is because they know each other. Right. So Ka had learned things about music making from him. They do things that are similar, right? Mm-hmm. They'll drop out drums Ka will do it all the time rock will do it a lot of times right mm-hmm. very, very soulful very lyrical but very sparse so there's to- so many similarities right those two albums to me are classic but it's completely different hmm. and they deserve the nuance to say well you know what if whatever sunya says is worthwhile let me take the time to just fish through this this thing here you know what i mean and see why because other than that, though, you just go by, you know, ratings on Amazon or, or algorithm. Listen to your algorithms on Spotify or, or some other shit. You know what I mean? Or YouTube music algorithms, which right. they always get me wrong. Though. Yeah, yeah. If I yeah, leave yeah, that shit playing into something else. They always <laughs> they ruin my day. They play some shit that got nothing to right, do right. With what I was doing. You know, <laughs> but that's why I got out of rating systems because I wanted it's my own writing. I wanted to shine too. It's mm-hmm. almost like if I drowned out my own mu- my own words with music, you know what I mean? Like it's it's like if it, it, almost like a, a, a producer drowns out an MC's vocals. To me, a rating system drowns out my words. Right, you know what I mean? Right, and it simplifies right. them to a grade and stuff. You know, you it, know, it gets to a point too where they might even just look at the rating system and not even read the rest. 
Here's the other thing, right? Rating systems only count in context of all the other records, right? Mm -hmm. So my rating system could be could be stifled to to the average person that's trying to get a beat on things, right? Here's why what, what I mean. The average listener doesn't hear as many records as me, right? Right. And they have their own idea about what a four record. Like we use the five source rating, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Because the double XL raising was a failure because it had less nuance. It only had five, right. whereas the source rating system has the halves, yeah, so it had more, yeah, yeah. right? So we use the source one. Let's say I give something a four, but it's a four because I have the context of maybe probably, let's say like now is May. Mm -hmm. If I write a review and give a grade, it's actually in the context, God, of 200 albums, because that's how many I have already Damn. this year. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. That I consider good work. So I'm taking, I have to take it then as a whole. Right. Now, the average person might have about 10, 15 at the most, a collector uh, or mo usually even less than that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll count it for streaming. Maybe they've streamed about 20 or 30. So their context is like, wait a minute, out of the shit I heard, this shit is bananas right here. This is how the fuck he gives it four and shit like that. You know what I mean? Right. And then I'm saving five because maybe I know certain artists more than the, than the reader. Mm -hmm. And I know that they could do even better. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm, right. right. And I know that, or I know that they left things on the ground floor. Right. You know what I'm saying? And they mm. only could do certain things with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and also, let's say if I hear things in the mix that I know that it wasn't mixed the, the way they wanted to. Mm. These things might not affect the listener, but they would affect me and lower the grade. Right. You know, so right. my grade is useless to the other person. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I have to be a bougie ass. So I'll be like, yeah, I've heard more music than you. Right. So I'm in a bigger world than you. You know what right. I mean? And, and that, that's, why, that's why eventually I never would add grades to it. Mm -hmm. you know I mean, you got to go through the whole thing. You know what I mean? I don't care. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because this whole music that we're doing, though, to me, I write it not as like, this is the underground. That's, I, I, don't, I, I don't like using the word underground. I'm, I'm the one that's writing about hip hop. Right. They're not. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So when you write about pop artists, when people write about Drake or this, they're not writing about hip hop. They're writing about dance music with words on it. <laughs> right. That's right. to me dance music with words on it. So I'm the one that's writing about hip hop. So I'm not the one that has the burden of proof here. So that's why if you get into it, you're going to want to spend the time to look at what's in there. You know? What yeah. I'm yeah, for sure. And and uh, yo. Yeah, in other my, words, my like bad, uh, my bad guy, we got uh, looks like you froze up a little bit. We good now, though. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. What about the other? What about the other book, God? Yeah, and um, the the other book, art on art. So basically, like throughout all these years, right? I was able to do since the 2010s. I was finally able to do what I always wanted to do on records. So since 1995, I've been crazy throughout all these magazines, and for anyone that would listen and would say, "Listen, we're not actually an element of hip hop." And we can be. Hmm. We can be if we write creatively about the music. Right. But if we, we just the art itself. if we just cover the music, then we're just... And that's why you see a lot of writers and journalists, they'll write aggressively, they'll hmm. write angry because they want to shine, they want to express themselves. And that's why you get a lot of bad reviews. You get a lot of bad music reviews. You get right. emotional stuff. <laughs> yeah. Because it's the only way to express themselves. The way I did it was, what if we wrote... What, would they, what if there was whatever poetries and prose and verse that I wanted that was, that, in, that was inspired by the art I'm covering and I threw it in there as part of the mosaic of the piece mm. and that it wouldn't be able to stand alone but would stand as an art piece on art, right. you know? Right. And um, these are things that I've written, like literally, like after I used to say this stuff, of course, I never said art on art. I didn't have it as detailed like that. I just knew we had to create. When I said these things, to the people, certain peoples I knew, that's where then all of a sudden Blaze Magazine came up and said they were the fifth element of hip hop. Oh, really? You know what I mean? really? So I'm, I'm, my degrees of separation are, are very small to all those groups. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I just don't mention names. People still have careers and they have lots of money, lots more money in hip hop than I do. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And um, if I compare, I'm poverty stricken in hip hop. You mm -hmm. know, if we judge my career by, by money. And once we got to the 2010s and I was with Paragon who designs a lot of my covers and I was with 
Kevlar 7, Remember the Perfection, right? The brother of Bronze mm-hmm. Nazareth. Mm-hmm. And they got me to write on Premier Hip Hop. I said, you know what? I'm going to let the pen smoke. They give me unlimited space. I'm going to let this shit smoke and let it be what it do. Mm-hmm. And so the only way I, after all these years of doing that, I was like, I want to highlight the verses, the poetry. Um, and now what's coming into a lot of songs that I'm on. A right. lot of songs I'm on that I do verse on. Right. You know? And if I could highlight them and then show you at the bottom where they were, where they were from. So art and art, right? Creations that born this hip hop writer element. These are the pieces of creativity that make it an element, like make it mm. a creative piece. So there are pros embedded inside the pieces, but I put so much on top of it <laughs> that I could extract it and extract those poems, those verses, and a lot of other stuff, you know, from reviews, from interviews, from features, and then from songs I've been on. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, and I asked PQ, who's designed tons of album covers, who makes beats himself. I said, he'd be perfect for this. Right. And I, I gave him the book. You know, I PDF'd him a copy of the book. And I said, listen, whatever you think this book represents to you, just make the shit colorful. Mm, <laughs> That's right. all I said to him. Right, right, right. Make it colorful. And he, he flipped it. You know what I'm That's saying? Fire. And yeah, embedded in the fire. cover is all the little things that he saw. Like, this is not a heart. This is a lung. Because I mm. refer to where I'm from in Medina, Brooklyn. The heart of Medina. We talk about the heart of Medina, but I'm from Sons of Park. Mm. So I used to always get into writing that I'm from the lettered lung of Medina. Dope. <laughs> so that's where that comes from. Dope. You know what I mean? Sons of Park. Trained, 120, love and loyalty, because I'm a low life, invisible renaissance, science on music. He just put all of these things. I see the 120 right there, too. That's right. That's yeah. right. 120. <laughs> you know, so like he put everything that I'm about, you know, on this, you know, and he, he just killed it. You know what I mean? And then I'm just really proud of that book. You know what I'm saying? That's like, um, that's my Cuban list, you know what I mean? I don't give yeah. a fuck if whoever MCs anywhere. The, no, that's what I was gonna the say. words in there the, hang with anybody. That's what I was going to say, God. Sometimes the <laughs> your whenever you're writing about some shit, like your your verse as far as like what you're writing about might be better than the actual music that you're covering sometimes. You know what I'm saying? You know, I think about that sometimes. <laughs> And so, yeah, and that's why I don't write about albums unless I love them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So you, the person may not love them as much as I do, but if I wrote a piece about your work, that means I love them. You know what I mean? That I love the work, you know what I mean? And it inspired me to write something. You know, it's interesting. I listen to the album, but when I write those poems, like especially the particular poem, I'm not listening to the album. I have the album in my head, but I'm listening Mm. to other music. I usually write poetry to other types of music. Yeah. I mean? Yeah, especially, um, especially soul music, you know, a lot of Phyllis Hyman, a lot of Donnie, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, most definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's that shit that inspired I, I was me. telling the God that when I write, I try to write like Donnie Hathaway sings. Wow. That's you perfect. know what I'm saying? And nobody could achieve that. Nobody could achieve that, but that's what I go for, you know right. what I mean? And so for everybody interested, I'm a, I, also I'm gonna put the link, you know. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I don't I, I these books are all on Amazon, Filtered Real, Real of 2021 and 2020, Art on Art, right? Mm-hmm. They're all on Amazon, but I'll sell it I sell it directly too, you know what I'm saying? Of course I make the most sales directly. You know, okay. so if, you, if people DM me in the Twitter, um if they DM me on, you know, Sunya 7 number 7 or Sunya's by itself S U N E Z on uh IG or if they email me, sunyas97 at gmail.com, I, I'll send it to you. You know what I mean? No doubt. But, no doubt. Um, yeah, we, so. We definitely appreciate these type of contributions. I'm serious. Because, like, seriously, man, you know, when it comes to hip-hop journalism, I always, I tell everybody, like, in my opinion, you know, like, you, you one of the best to ever do it. You know, like, you have, I know you mentioned Bone, Bones Malone a lot. and Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Greg Tate and rest in peace, you know. You know, what's interesting is that old, I find a lot of guys dope, Greg Tate, Nelson George, but I don't read their work. Mm. I've almost never read their work. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, Bones Malone is the biggest influence on me, but I only read two columns. And he knows. Is it, it. it kind of like an MC not wanting to listen to too Absolutely. many different MCs? Absolutely. Mm. The ethos was I can't copy. And I knew Bones was so dope. And I didn't understand everything. I knew that if I kept reading his stuff, I would copy it. Right. Right. You know, vicariously. Mm. And I, I didn't want that to happen. You know what I'm saying? Um, the biggest inspiration for me to write is actually a segue to what we're here to talk about, jazz. You know what I'm mm. saying? Because 
Amiri Baraka is probably my biggest influence. Him and Miguel wow. Pinheiro, you know what I mean? Wow. Um, Miguel Pinheiro because he was a Boricua in those times. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And in my journey of getting knowledge of self, I also had to be radicalized to my own immediate history. And I spent a lot of time in Spanish Harlem. So I was learning about salsa, the music that we were making first in New York City. Right. You know what I mean? And I spent a lot of time with OGs, listening, cracking open records. You know what I'm saying? Like that. Right, like, right, right. No right. Mark Anthony, none of that shit. So <laughs> we was hearing old shit, old mm. shit. I was the young kid buying old shit. And so the OGs love me. You know what I mean? And, um, and in doing that, I also, you know, got into the other legends of the time. And, and that's why I got into Miguel Pinheiro and his cadences, his grittiness. Because I felt like what all hip-hop journalists missed, aside from Bones, was a grittiness. Mm -hmm. And Bones Malone has a street grit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And my time as a youth is not really in the streets. My time as a youth is trying to see where I belong. Mm. So is it a longer incubation period? And when I go out to do hip hop and writing about hip hop, and by the time I'm 17, 18, I already know about the, the, the flaws of the street, the pitfalls of the street, and I'm totally clean of all the crime. Right. right. So the grit that I put into it is the revolutionary aura, the, 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 the radicalism, the militancy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Those things that I'm angry about. You know what I mean? Right. Because even my quest to get knowledge of self as a five percenter, I had to go get it. You know, so I was never given the knowledge of self. So the way I write, though, has a lot of that. I'm going uptown, and if they say I can't get this shit, I'm going to bomb them up myself. That's how I went when I went to a law school in Mecca. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Right, right. I was like, if they say Puerto Ricans can't get this knowledge, I'm going to inside. Because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And, um... Everything was always rough. Everything was always rugged. And that's what I put into, into the writing. You know what I mean? And Amiri Baraka was someone that because he was doing everything in jazz, he was writing about the jazz militantly. He was, uh, he was um, when Amiri Baraka wrote, he wrote poetry. You know what I'm saying? Um, he went into these uh, stream of conscious riffs, even though he's talking about an album. You know what I mean? And I thought, yo. Right. This guy could do anything while he's, you know, writing. And I then gotta, he also made music. He made plays. He made everything. You know what I'm saying? I, and, um, I got an Amiri Baraka record where. That's right. I mean, yeah. It's, um, what was the name of that album? I forgot. But it's, it's man, it's extremely, like, soulful. He, was, he loved the avant-garde period. The Albert mm -hmm. Ayler, all of that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. He loved the far out shit. And, um. I'm not in his wheelhouse with that. That's not my favorite eras of jazz. Mm. You know what I mean? But everything that he was doing, I was like, yo. And I stood one day because no one was letting me write this way. If I wrote one, all I could do, they give you 200 words. Right. <laughs> let me make that first sentence then really, really fly. Mm. And it would always get butchered to be <laughs> formulaic and go down the conveyor belt. You know what I'm saying? I was losing all my sentences and shit. That's is why everything it, in the like in the editing process, in the editing process. Yeah. yeah. Everything that I wrote for a major magazine doesn't have my voice. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Almost nothing. The only thing that got kept, but also kept me from getting more pieces from them was the big feature I did on beat nuts. Mm -hmm. And in there I wrote about, I literally wrote word for word, the conversation I had with Juju about the knowledge of self. Wow. Because he was told by uh, Tariq that was in the beat nuts, a third of the trio. Yeah. That Dominicans can't be God. Nah, that's, that's not. I put that in there and I yeah. spelled my name, Savior of the Universe now shows who proves the equality of zigzag zig. <laughs> and I was putting that everywhere in there. And I put it in there and it made it made it into the copy. Mm. But I didn't make it into the next issues. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh man. I mean, that's that's amazing history, God. And yeah. and you know, like I I the reason one of the reasons other than you being my brother and a great, uh, you know, just knowledgeable person, man. Um, we have these conversations about jazz and, Absolutely. Uh, and you, you talk it at a high level, God. And so I wanted, I wanted to, um, you know, just kind of let the, you have a conversation with you on camera where a lot of people who may be interested in the genre are learning more about it because the, I mean, it's a wonderful history. You know right. what I'm saying? And, Absolutely. Uh, and you you put me on hella books as far as uh you know jazz goes. Oh, and, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. You know, and um 
even when I was influenced by Baraka, I wasn't as much of a jazz head. Mm. You know what I'm saying? For me at that time, the jazz I was listening to was salsa. Mm. Because, because the roots of the, the biggest roots of North American music are song and jazz. Like mm -hmm. those are the most recorded. Those are the most jazz, of course, is way like way above as far as the amount of recordings. But as far as like Latin music, son is at the top. What is it called again? Son, S O N, Cuban S -O -N. son. Cuban you know, son. so you say it's like spelled like son, but you say son. Okay. You know? And Cuban son sounds like salsa, except imagine it with less solos or very articulated solos. In mm. other words, this is where you solo. Give me the trumpet, do, 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 do. And then, you know, mm -hmm. everything is segmented, very, very strict, right? The salsa musicians, right? The only real differences in salsa is where it's from and the lyrical content. And because mm. I come from hip hop, that's a genre for me. Right. You know what right. I mean? Right. And so in the 70s, you literally get, before you get musicians that have no instruments, hip hop, mm -hmm. you get musicians that have no, not a lot of uh, um, schooling. Mm. And certainly not a lot of formal schooling. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you have people that are very well schooled, like a um, like a Roberto Ruena who just returned to the Essence, right? Who played bongos and was very familiar with the Puerto Rican bomba, plena, all of those. He knew all of those. But you also had people like Ray Barreto who played congas. He really didn't know a lot of bomba. Like he didn't mm. even know his own roots. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Right. So they were making up as they went along and they added a lot of texture to things. And they used the jazz improvisation to make up for a lot of the skill sets that they didn't have. Mm. So a lot people like Tito Puente, who was way before, he mm -hmm. called them kitty bands. You know what I mean? He wow. said, why, why did they call them that? Because the best example is Willie Colon, right? Mm -hmm. Listen to Willie Colon's first record in Malo, and you'll hear like distortion, you'll hear trombones in the mix. So imagine trombones in the salsa band. Salsa band has regularly. Congas, bongos, timbales. So that's three sets of percussion going, right? Piano is played like percussion because they pound the piano. Right, right, right? Right, right. And then you have the, they call the vittles, right? The maracas, maybe a guido if they want, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of percussion and hitting going. Then you have a, in a small club, like up in Soundview in the Bronx, Jerome Avenue, and they're playing with three trombones. Mm, wow. They also have a bass player. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, just think about the noise from all that percussion and all that bass hitting. The records sound that way. They blare everything like that. But what these musicians developed as they went along, like Willie Colon. And then they also had like legend singers like Lavo, whose voice was astronomical because he actually was able to cut through all of that, which is ridiculous mm. without screaming because right. you don't really scream as a sonero. And the word sonero is like the singer. And that, that's like an MC name. Okay. You know, so like a salsa singer is like what you hear Mark Anthony doing. Ah. They don't have any, they don't have, literally, they don't have bars. Okay. So after the set lyrics, you would sing sonales, uh, chorus, then line, chorus, and then you rhyme the previous line. You rhyme, ah. you just rhyme. And right. when you're live, you're usually making that up. Really? So it's a lot of bars. So guys like legends like Cheo Feliciano, La mm -hmm. Voz, and stuff, they would have disses on their shit. Really? <laughs> you know, they have this, you know? wow. The famous song, the famous signature song of Hector Lavoe, El Cantante, is so emotional about his life as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. But the actual um, song is written by Blades. Mm. But the sonales, right? The rhymes that go at the end, he's dissing other singers. <laughs> so one of the sonales, he literally says, um, you know, I sing with pants, though. I don't wear a skirt. Wow. <laughs> and when I got to build Willie Colon, he told me who it was that he was dissing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it was just dope. Like, you know, yeah, you it got was to build dope. Willie Colon? I did. I did. You wow. know, for a while. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and um, and I got those receipts, too, because I yeah, got. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like, you know, shit. But um, it, it was just a great time to learn about the music. When I got in, what got me into jazz, though, was the same way most people that love hip hop. Collecting samples. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. My obsession with collecting samples started with soul music. You know what I'm saying? And you get the juggernauts. You know, Marvin, for me, they were Marvin Gaye. James Brown. Aretha, James Brown, uh, Al Green. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And uh, Stevie Wonder. Like, you get, you know, and then 
you start with the juggernauts, you know, you, you slide into Motown stuff, right? You know, the basics and shit like that. Right. You know what I mean? And then you get into the other stuff, you know? But when I started to get into jazz, I started to say, listen, I don't have a lot of money. And jazz records, for some reason, they were harder to steal, too. I was great <laughs> at stealing <laughs> records. But when I go into the store with jazz stuff, they had yeah. more cameras and all that kind yeah, of shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's not like stealing. <laughs> they just didn't give a shit. Right. You know what I mean? Because I, I was very obsessed. I never stole, you know, my low life reality i've never stolen a garment but boy have i taken tapes yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey man i on the cool i used to work at i used to work at blockbuster music god i already oh man yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't even want to talk about look, it you know, <laughs> you know and it was cr it was crazy i i when i got into hip-hop i i got obsessed with music and i had to listen to everything mm -hmm. you know so i have to listen to everything at least once or and and then the ownership was secondary it was about listening to everything yeah you know what i'm saying and now it's about the ownership because i want to hear it again right and i have the access to listen to it again but um when i started to get into jazz i had collected other genres already so i could i was able to say let me be more of an informed consumer and the reason was is because another great influence in my hip-hop journalism career i encountered do jazz again mm. and that was when I would fall asleep listening to um, really deep sleep, listening to Stretch and Bobbito. Mm. So they're going from Thursday nights, <laughs> 1 to 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I get two two-hour cassettes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. have to try to wake up every hour to flip it. Mm -hmm. But then, like, I'd mess up and I, I or I got it. But that last hour, if I got the last hour, I would be knocked out. Mm -hmm. That's how I make my pause tapes. The two full hours would then get extracted and placed lovely in my pause tape mix right. so much so that people thought i dj the tapes because <laughs> I, you know i had the whole thing and i was able to just put it in there right but um that's the key that's the key a lot of people don't know that they didn't know that you know what i mean they were trying to like just record at the moment nah 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 that's, that's how i did it you gotta get yeah you gotta record the whole show and then extract you know nice. right? Uh -huh. so what it would happen is i would fall asleep so they would have like reggae dance or i'd be sleeping through all that but i would wake up around five six and then Phil Schapp, you know, he returned to the essence too, like during COVID times. I don't know if it was about COVID, but it was around that time. And um, he was doing a show about, uh, I think it was called, I think, I don't know if he called it Bird Flight, but it was Bird something after Charlie Parker, right? Mm -hmm. And he would be playing Charlie Parker records. And I said, wait a minute, 89.9, they play, they play all types of sh shit that isn't pop. Right. So I said, let me listen to some of this shit. And what drew me in was because Phil Schapp was doing what I wanted to do in hip hop. Mm, what was that? You know, I wanted to be an obsess obsessively detailed about the music. Yeah. I didn't want you to just say, oh, that, this song's great because it has lots of bass. You know, if you notice, you've read my work. Like when I detail like a bass line or something, I really try to give you the details of the bass line. Yeah. How it goes in like and, and give vision so that these songs are different from each other. Right. You know what I mean? And Phil Schapp was deep. He had all these details. He'd tell like 1962, we were here. And I remember he was here and we were talking to Monk. And I was like, mm. dude, this is what I got to get up to that level. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And right. then they would have marathons, right? And they would do, they did three mainly. They always did Miles Davis, Billie Holiday, and um, Coltrane. Mm -hmm. And they would literally play their albums from the beginning of their career wow. and marathon them straight through. Wow. And I would just be at work listening to this shit. Cause I, I, you know, I always got jobs as an editor, so I'm not, I'm listening to this shit all day. Right. And I started to learn about the music. Like, what do I buy? What do I get? You know what I'm saying? And the first guy that I got into was Miles Davis, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that it leads to another idea that I talk about is like, you know that I try to give people detail about other genres, but through my hip hop perspective and with the hip hop perspective, they affected the way I went into other genres. When I look for samples of funk, I was looking for something that was the original dirty. Mm, right. You know what I'm saying? Like the original dirty and J look, James Brown's best example. His stuff is as grimy as the beats that were made from him. Right. You know what I mean, right. When I got into salsa heavily, it was because I got, a 1972 album. I just my my first the 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 my first daughter's mother had it 
just laying around. And so, you know me, I was scooping up everybody. I said, yo, that's yours? I don't know. That's mine. You know what yeah, I mean? right. Let me get and that. I was listening to it going. It was 1972, Willie Colon, Hector Lavo singing El Juicio. And I was like, yo, this is the hardest shit I ever, I ever heard. And one of the horn samples was used by Main One, who's a Puerto Rican rapper that didn't really blow up. But if you dig in the crates, Main One had an album and, and he had a song called Gran Combo, named after the the, the mm. Puerto Rican, uh, you know, big, big ensemble. Mm. Probably the biggest big band group in salsa history. Um, and it had like Fat Joe, Curious George, had a lot of Puerto Rican guys on it. And um, I was blown away. The way Lavo was singing, I was like, wait, Mark Anthony didn't do this shit. Right. He didn't, he didn't say like these aggressive rhymes. There was, you know, like, and then I kept collecting and the aggressiveness, the ruggedness, that's what appealed to me. So slower different types of son montunos because when you when you study son they have different they they the genres are really just different tempos bolero slow bolero son is a little bit up more pace mm -hmm. uh son montuno is like all oh, groovy smooth like they all have different paces i didn't care about none of that other slow mm -hmm. shit i didn't have the, the the ear to hear that yet but the fast hardcore shit that's what i was collecting mm -hmm. and that was what was the 70s, you know what I mean? That peak. When I got into jazz, I already had so much other type of genres that were aggressive. Mm -hmm. So much funk music, all of this stuff that I loved. I was like, I'm looking for jazz for like grown shit. It's funny, mm -hmm. I was like, I was looking for that grown shit. And the way Miles Davis played, if you liken it, he masters the lower register just like Sade. Mm. Like if you give people a vision of what it's like, right. you know what I mean? The way he plays trumpet, he masters the lower register, so his ballads are next level. Right. And so they seem like a real conversation that's contrasted. One of the things about Miles Davis' work as a composer is that he's so great at making contrast and tension. And this is a thing that musicians talk about, is tension. What, is know, that, what does that mean musically? The great Eddie Palmieri, right? He's a, his salsa... He's like, um, I, I told you this, he's like the Eddie, he's like the DJ premiere of salsa, you know right, what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. And he's a great jazz pianist. So a lot of his songs would be 10 minutes long with like a long intro, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he has mad swing to it, but it'll give you jazz solos. And what he talks about tension too, is that it needs to be contrasting with something else. So like that Montuno that he plays in the piano, mm -hmm. I, I'll give you the Montuno. And then the other guy is going to come in with the, you know, like he's going to contrast it. Right. So that okay. tension of things battling each other, you know, or like the beautiful ballad, my, my favorite jazz song of all time. I literally play, have played it every single day right before I teach my course. Mm. I teach it before I, I play it before anything important I have to do is Miles Davis Blue and Green from the Kind of Blue Oh, yeah, album, love that, right? love that, yeah. But you see how Bill Evans' piano introduces everything and his cuts in, it doesn't go with. Right. It kind of cuts in. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And Miles Davis is a master at that. And that's what I was looking for. I was looking for something slower. I was looking for something to go with my life as a, as, as a man that was building a family with children. Mm -hmm. And I said, what, what's some, uh, I need other types of music. I needed my own classical music. Right, you right, mean? right. And but you know what? That's funny you said that, God. I've, I've heard jazz writers call jazz classical music. I do too. And it's the only original composed music of the United States. Right. You know what I'm saying? There, there's nothing else like it. And... I had obviously soul classics, um, the blue, many of the blues ballads, but the many, many, I have thousand plus soul ballads that I have, right? Right. But to me, those are more intimate. Mm. You know what I'm saying? In different yeah. ways. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Especially with a lady or something like that, right? There, yeah, that John ways. Coltrane or you feel album, that, that album called Ballads. Right. With, with, Jazz, they could be anything you want it to be. Facts. You know what I'm saying? And I just loved it. I love the mid-tempos. I love what they were doing with the music, all of that kind of stuff. And I also love that I didn't understand a damn thing. Mm -hmm. So, like, when I learned about Monk, 
Thelonious Monk, and I bought Brilliant Corners. Everybody starts with Brilliant Corners. That's mm-hmm. say, you know. And I was like, "What the fuck is this shit?" <laughs> right, right. You know right, what I'm saying? Right, right. I didn't get it. I was like, and I said, "You know what, though? I'm gonna hold it." Mm-hmm. And so I assumed that I didn't get it, though. Just like I was doing with a lot of what helped me be a, a, a better hip hop journalist. You know, <laughs> one of the reasons too. Remember we talked about grades. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> one of the things about grades is that there are things that could resonate with you, and you love it and you see the excellence. But other things, you if you're a good journalist, you notice it, but you don't like it. Right. And to separate the, those two feelings is very difficult mm. because it has to do with like and dislike with music. So a lot of times I can say that something is really good, but I don't like that shit. Yeah. yeah. See what I mean? Yeah. And a lot of people can't do that. And you certainly, if you can't do that as a journalist, though. Right, because journalist. most people have an emotional attachment. Right, to right. Music. And, and let me tell you something. You can't like everything. Right. You know what I'm saying? So you have to make a, a distinction of what you like the most. And then also what you like the most, you may be giving it more preference than it needs, though. So like for myself, with, with, with hip hop, there's some like regular, I would put the word regular, like regular <laughs> potato chips, regular boom bap. You know <laughs> right, what I'm saying? Right, right, right. And I love those records. But in reality, they're not as good as the other records. Mm, you know what I'm right, saying? Right. And so I have to be fair to that. But they're my regular potato chips. You know what I'm saying? Well, let, let me ask you this then, God, because you make you bring up a good point, and I think that because you know, like you, how you mentioned um, sampling allowed you to explore other genres, right? And mm-hmm. we're at an era now where there's not as much um, sampling, I would say, where the youth can get introduced uh, to different genres, and you know, just people are all ages, really. You know, there's it's never you're never too old to learn anything. Yeah, yeah. But there's one thing I wanted to ask you because you mentioned it. So my introduction to jazz was uh, Love Supreme, right? And so I would listen to it, and I was like, "Yo, I don't, I don't understand this shit, man. I just, I just don't get it, right?" And then one night, I couldn't sleep, and I threw it on, and it's just like something clicked. It, I was like, it, "Yo, it's true, it's true." I was like, and so you, you know, mentioned that with Monk. Yeah, yeah. So what is that about, man? Like when it comes to jazz, I'll tell you something. Just, it's all what you're informed with, right? Mm-hmm. And for me, I think jazz hit very easily for me, too. Also, too, because I was also into... My brother's an actor, but he's also... An, the way I am with music, he is with film. Mm, right, right. You know what I'm saying? So if someone would say, does Sunyas know more music than he knows film? You'd have a battle. Mm. <laughs> That's how much he knows film. Just with really the contact. You know, Damn. context. Mm. And I, I saw so much good film that I was already acquainted and was falling in love vicariously with a lot of jazz rhythms right. because he played a lot of 60s movies you know so a lot of oliver nelson and other people were in there quincy jones a lot of his early scores and films are very jazz based because that's mm. where he's coming from right you know what i mean so the syncopation of jazz able to bring an offbeat and accents to things right and lead, let those accents to things drift you into different lanes mm-hmm. that are uncharted worlds this is something that works really good in a movie score because it change the action changes, right? Right, right. You know right, what I'm saying? Right. right. And um, and there's also a character that you can develop like that. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? That could be very distinct. Um, unlike the classical music score, you know what I mean? Yeah. And um, it could be even more personal. And I, I think that when something hits too, is all music to me. To really understand it, whether you admit one admits it or not, though, they're compartmentalizing it all the time. You know what I'm saying? So, like, the reason, like, we're talking about how how could I write so so many reviews in such a short time and make this book? It's because when I hear music, I hear everything separated very quickly. Mm, what do you, you mean? Know what I'm saying? So it's almost like it goes into my ear this way and uh-huh. it turns into this. <laughs> it comes out as stems. Right. It comes out <laughs> as the different, you know, so. I learned that with salsa because mm. salsa has so much noise. Mm-hmm. And I was like, which parts do I like best though? And it, you know, obviously in the beginning it became the bongos. I love the sound of a bongo, you know what I mean? And um, and also I also hate the use of bongos in 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 wacky, crazy cartoons and scenes. <laughs> right. So racist to me, it really right. but anyway. Right. Right. <laughs> right. You know, now, that drum you... that Kanye keeps using, you know, that Kanye was using. Uh, I haven't listened to Kanye in years. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? 
Uh, but but um, you, when you mentioned the tension, and we had a conversation about polyrhythms, right? Like, and the thing yeah. about jazz, whenever you look at like um, Coltrane's drawing of the circle of fists, like these, like whether they were, whether they knew math or not, they were extremely mathematical with the yeah, way that yeah. this did. And that's why Dizzy Gillespie said, we didn't have polyrhythms in the drums. Mm. They were there in the horn section. Right, right. You know what I mean? And um, th these ideas of different rhythms and melodies, because really the course of different styles of jazz is really the course of adding different things to it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, early New, New Orleans jazz, you're going to have the big bands. You know right. what I'm saying? Big bands are doing it, but they're, that innovation is coming together. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And you don't notice it unless you have certain legends that just pierce through, like uh, Louis Armstrong. You know what I mean? But you don't hear it unless you hear the collective. Mm -hmm. So the collective is an ensemble, and they go through the formats and then improvise through them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. What, like, Ted Joe, uh, Joa, um, one of the great jazz writers, you know, he calls, like, the ABBA format. You know what I mean? The ABBA format, where, like, there is a format, but the improvisations are also in that format. Right. You know what I mean? Right. And that's how you know there's a structure to the song, but not, of course, when you get to avant-garde jazz, they deliberately try to throw away all the formats. You know what I'm saying? No, when, a lot no, of it. Well, let me, I don't mean to cut you, cut your wisdom, but I just have a question. So whenever they, so like when Miles Davis was composing like uh, the songs on Conda Blue, right? Would he... Would he give Coltrane's like would that, like that was, would he would Coltrane right. be improvising or would he be playing what? Nah, it'd was... be it would be a kind of blue is like the epitome of almost nothing given. Right. There's just a skeletal frame. There's no set chords. Nothing. Right. So that's why it's called modal jazz. You know what I mean? Mm. And um, modal jazz has it. The idea of modal jazz is earlier, but not really fully fleshed out. Mm -hmm. So Juan Tizo, actually the Boricua, that was one of the co-composers along with a lot of records with Dizzy Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. he had ideas about that, you know, and how they mm -hmm. developed is funny because he had like the sheet music backwards, wow. <laughs> you, know, <right? laughs> you know, but um, with, with Miles and Kind of Blue, everything that Miles did was basically trying to just explore more, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And a lot of his innovations, like in the hip hop way of saying it, was a very much like Rock Him. Mm. What if we slow down shit? Mm. Right. And a lot of his stuff is like, what if we minimize this? We can accelerate that. Right. You know, because Rock Him slows down the beat, where everybody's like, what the fuck are you doing? But then the lyrics become mad complex. So he just changed the balance of it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, the evolutions of Miles Davis with the modal jazz that, you know, he develops, that becomes developed. I wouldn't say he develops it, but he becomes developed with Kind of Blue is basically giving all these varying musicians. Cause that's one of the things that um, makes them unique too, is that unlike most uh, jazz players and players in general, having a synergy with each other, these players were all different. Cannibal right. Adderley had different ideas. Coltrane, you would see, had different ideas of what he would do with the music. And then Miles had different ideas that he was going to leave behind that shit, too. Right. And to have them all work on Kind of Blue and just have great synergy. You know, even the Bill Evans did different stuff. He did like a chamber jazz music, mm. you know, after that. That was like the the that uh, center point where they all collided to make this thing. where like, it's going to give a loose baseline of what we'll do. Let's see what happens here. And it's just, to me, when, it's perfe perfection. When you, know you think I mean? of uh, Miles Davis, John Coltrane, Bill Evans, Cannonball, Adderley, uh, who um, who was on percussion? Oh, shit. Um, I think, was it, let me see. I, I, we can find out. I, 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 always, I always forget. And it's funny because he's the last one. He, he was alive the longest out of all of them, you know? Um, uh, Jimmy Cobb, I think it was. It yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And so is that, would you say that's the, like, uh, is that like for, for people that may not be uh, into jazz or know much about it, like how would you describe that collection? Well, you know what I learned that it's a great segue for musicians because it's so skeletal that you could study them. Mm. You're saying? I don't think it's hard to play it as beautifully as them. 
but they, it's easy to start studies and it's influenced everything from rock to classical, you know, the way people play. Mm -hmm. But um, I think for sheer beauty of it, it's a great seg record to begin with. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> and also because it has a little bit of everything. So what happens is they have like the straight bop record, like the, you know, the Freddie Freeloader. Mm -hmm. They have the blues record, all blues. Like they have all of the elements that jazz includes and that jazz is built by mm -hmm. inside the record. And I don't, it feels, I don't know if they did that on purpose, but it just came out that way. Right. You know, and it may have came out that way because as the as he's making the album, he's probably thinking, I want to let everybody shine. And by that, letting everybody shine, everybody gets a segment of the styles that they could, they could get into. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, so it's really a perfect record. You know what I mean? For me, I, I, I've always loved it. Um, it's a starting point record. But I don't know if I don't know if it's head and shoulders above other records Miles Davis has done. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's, mm. I find others so great too, you know what I'm saying? And um, But Kind of Blue and especially for hip hop, Kind of Blue and Love Supreme is where you got to start. Yeah, that's why those are the first two records those, I had. Those are the two records that, that anybody would start with. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? That they, I wouldn't start them off with anything else, you know? And Kind of Blue is so easy because... Um, it has such a raw beauty to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? While, while it took me some time to get Love Supreme when I heard Kind of Blue, like I got it immediately for some reason. Right. It's just that type of record. And not to veer off too far, but yeah. I definitely want to build on this with you because I, I find that conversation fascinating where I was listening to Stanley Crouch and he has, oh, called, yeah. he has called Miles Davis a sellout. Yeah, and yeah. Yep, and he doubles down on that shit like all the time, right? And so, um, you know, um, what's your I, thoughts on that? And yeah, if you yeah. tell the people why, I, first, I have, tell, first tell yeah. the people why he was he was saying that. I, I would say this: it goes back to Stanley Crouch himself, a great writer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And also someone who, like a lot of guys that wrote about jazz, we just caught them delving into areas they don't like. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Um, it would be a bad example, but it's almost like if uh, if someone says my writing, well, Sunyas loves all the hip hop, but he hates reggaeton. So that's where he stops. <laughs> It'll be the same way, even though there's no musicality in reggaeton. But um, <laughs> but he's not the only jazz writer. A lot of a lot. Like, for example, right. Miles Davis always got slack because he was always leaving errors. Mm. You know what I'm saying? He was yeah. always leaving things behind and. <laughs> he never um he always felt that what he was going to do what he was doing was getting exploited along with the idea of an artist getting bored right. so those two things clashed they not clashed but they synergized to make him leave things quickly mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and so like like when he invented cool jazz which really is like a slowing down of a lot of the uh, uh bebop mm -hmm. you know so that's the first levels of slowing it down he's the one that innovated that but right. because he recorded that out in L.A., it became a thing out in L.A. with all the white musicians. Yeah, of course. West Coast jazz. Right, the West Coast mm -hmm. jazz. And there are greats out there. Like, I love Chet Baker. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I think he's great. I even like the way Chet Baker sings, even though it's off-putting to the ear. If, you, <laughs> if you're into soul music and stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and he's very white. His voice is very white, like off and white. But it's dope. But his playing was really nice. Mm -hmm. He really could play that trumpet. So he was all around. But... Um, when Miles left that, then he's going into something else. You know what I mean? He, he did the modal. Um, he did the rock fusion. And in between those fusions, there are exceptional records in between that don't really have like a place. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, like you have in a silent way, you know, where he was taking, he was where he started to record musicians for like a whole session that went mad long. And then when he made a silent way, he left that, he he left. He took portions that didn't have a cohesive ending. Mm. So it it's such a drift, a, a record you could drift through. But when you listen to it, it's like really complex, right? And he was able to make all these different type of records. You know what I mean? And um, it's because he's leaving things behind. You know what I mean? And, and I, I think that's one of the things with Miles Davis. 
And it's only a point where someone would get frustrated at what he leaves behind. Yeah. And you get back. Because they, they wanted more. Of, right. They needed yeah. more of that, though. You know? Yeah. Like, for Miles Davis, I love that 59 year. You know? Uh, I don't Jorge think I've heard that. The, the, the year of 59. Oh, 50, oh his 59. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What uh, came out then? Kind of blue. Mm-hmm. Jorge and Bess. Oh, yeah. Sketches of Spain. I love Sketches of Spain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, miles Ahead. Then you have milestones. Like, these are all incredible records. And he just left that. Right. But because he left that, and the next band he made, the, the, the quintet, is one of the legendary. It had Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter. Like, legendary. his ear for musicians was mind-blowing. Yeah. Like, he yeah. was recruiting the legends of tomorrow. You right. know what I'm saying? Art Blakey so, as well. He, he, I yeah. think he had a great ear for... Oh, no, definitely. I mean, yeah. he had Horace Silver, and he had, mm. like ridiculous you know what i mean and um i was at a i, I took a, a a date one time to birdland mm-hmm. you know what, what is birdland birdland is like the famous club in in, in new york city okay. you know what i'm saying and i and i took i i i, I we went to see lou donaldson mm-hmm. you know and i was thinking like lou donaldson i don't care what he plays because I, I like his jazz i like his funk jazz yeah you know what i mean and um if you if for hip hop, you'll know him by "Ode to Billy Joe." Okay. Um, it's the it's the the drums that Grand Puba used, mm-hmm. the drums that that Cypress Hill used on Little Butos. You know the drum roll. <laughs> you know that that drum yeah, roll. I'm gonna listen to that when we get right? up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you'll know it immediately, right? Everybody's right. used this record, right? And he made a lot of funk jazz. Mm-hmm. So I was thinking, like, I was floored when he was playing like straight ahead you know, jazz, hard bop jazz. Mm-hmm. And he was, took a moment during the thing. This is like 2007. And he was like, you know, we kept the jazz pure, you know, not like certain people like Miles oh, that they sold shit. out. And I was like, oh, and I'm shit. like, you know, when <laughs> Feinfeld looks at the girl and he goes, you're a cashier. <laughs> like he was criticizing his job as a comedian. He goes, yeah. you're a cashier. <laughs> like, I was like, yo, you, you did those records too. Right. Like, <laughs> right. I got the I got the samples to prove it. Like, well, well God, here's my thing. So you Stanley have Stanley Crouch though. Like, yeah. Stanley Crouch though is a unique example. I think musicians did that because they wanted to solidify their audience. Mm-hmm. Because just like when you trend, you could get more sales if you were anti the commercial artist. The truth is, those records of rock fusion that he made are so different than a rock album yeah. that they influence rock albums more than they mm. actually are like rock albums. Well, you know God, well this is what I want to ask you. So James and Tume said <sighs> that, he said, man, after a while, ain't nothing else you can play out of that instrument. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> like whenever. You know, I, I think so. I, Miles was always exploring, you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And the truth is, is that here's the thing, right? Stanley Crouch, I used as a as a teenager. I hated all of his articles. He wrote daily <laughs> editorials weekly in the Daily News. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I would hate everything he wrote about hip hop. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I wrote every. I hated everything he wrote about Tupac <laughs> while he was alive because he hated Tupac. Damn, I didn't know everything <laughs> about Tupac was wrong. He yeah. was a jerk. He was a thug. He yeah, was, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, he wrote it on his belly. He wrote it on his belly. Like he's one. Of, <laughs> you know what now that you say that i think i have heard him say some disparaging shit about hip-hop but he hated hip-hop yeah he thought it was unmusical all of these kind of things and so i hated him but he was an exceptional writer and the thing about miles right is that what they didn't get was that another like for example another great legendary writer ralph ellison right he mm-hmm. wrote yeah, most definitely. the greatest novels ever mm-hmm. he also had a lot of jazz writings right right and in his jazz writings, he actually said that um, he didn't like what Miles Davis was doing, the way he performed. Now, he's not talking about the funk era. He didn't live that long. Mm-hmm. He's talking about like the the, 40, the 50s and the 60s. Like, how dare he turn his back to the audience? <laughs> That's you know? crazy. And this, remember, all our musics, whether it's Black American, whether it's in the Caribbean, how do we perform our songs? You know, especially yeah. like the Caribbean. I don't know. You're doing a 10 minute song. You're smiling through the whole shit. Right. But but Miles was on some crazy. Huh. He's on some shit like, yo, you came here to hear this shit. You didn't come here to, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, because he was so sharp, he was mm-hmm. so cool. The way he dressed was always different. Mm-hmm. 
his persona itself became something, even though that's what he was trying. He wasn't really trying to do that. Right. He was dressing up dope because that's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so he was making a persona of himself all the time. It's when that persona comes in contrast to what you envision jazz ought to be. Mm. And then you start that's getting it. beat. Then it's a problem. So now he reinvents himself and he starts being hip. He's, you know, he was supposed to do. Betty Davis was it helping him with his wardrobe. <laughs> yeah. And Betty Davis music was crazy. Crazy. <laughs> you know, and then he's going to dress like the way she was doing. I'm yeah, like, yo. Yeah. <laughs> and me as a, as going backwards, mm. I was like, I love the suits that he was wearing. I was like, yo, that's the sharpest shit. Yeah. And then when I saw the shit that he was wearing, I was like, nah. <laughs> because the, hip, the hip hop perspective is like, no, nah, we don't want them to dress like funk because we don't. That's what um african band was doing and then yeah. it. like no 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 no. we gotta have our own urban style right so i didn't like that mm. but then when i was looking closer i was like yo he was really endearing himself to that whole crowd that was into hendrix these are people he was gonna work with hendrix yeah. he was cool with wow i and the family stone Damn. all these people mm -hmm. i think drugs obviously you know and other things deterred him to make records with all these people but they was all in the same wavelength. Damn, that would have been amazing. You know what I mean? And yeah. can you imagine a Sly and a Family Stone with, band with, with playing with Miles that shit and what he would get him to do? Oh, yeah, my goodness. Man. That shit would have been fire right there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then people didn't respect the funk because the funk goes into a beat and explores mm. that same beat. So the syncopation is of a different style. You yeah. never lose the depth of that beat because that bass line we're addicted to. Right. That right. drum we're addicted to, we want to see it explored. So like a Funkadelic song, you know, we want to hear Clinton. going to be on the one. Yeah, we want to keep him repeating that phrase for 14 mm -hmm. minutes and we're okay. Well, you know what I'm saying? Well, that goes I against all, all the ethos of jazz. Yeah. So how could, how could Miles Davis incorporate that? And yet when you hear so albums like On the Corner... Right, the 1972 album, which has a beautiful cover, by the way. It's a drawn cover. It looks like a black exploitation movie, mm -hmm. but a cartoon black exploitation movie. Mm -hmm. And I still don't have a funk album that sounds like On the Corner. Right. And then they also released, you know, years ago, the complete On the Corner sessions. And those shits are crazy. So when you get like the complete sessions of these rock fusion albums, like Jack Johnson, uh, Bitches Brew, you really see what he was doing. Yeah. And yeah. then you also see well, what made him pick this as the song as opposed to all of this dope shit. Well, that's what I was going to ask you, God. You, you put me on a theory that you have created. Um, and it's a science to me, you know, where it's point of contact with right. the album. Right. You and see, I, like, you see well, how. If, well, hold on, if, just one second. No, okay, like, okay. Point of contact with the album. But then an album like Bitches Brew, right? Mm -hmm. if you don't have if you don't understand <laughs> right <laughs> and you might yeah. be like what the fuck yeah. is this shit like yeah. this is terrible right right like, like but if you can just tell me why it's important to understand like the you know just the and the whole science of the point of contact with the album to help you get the album oh yeah yeah <clears throat> point of contact only certain music journalists will have it you know so like because of the eras i've been in I have point of contact from the mid nineties onward. Right. You know what I'm saying? So from 1994 on, I've been writing, I'm there with the, with the music. You know what I mean? So I have an advantage that others don't. Mm -hmm. And I came up with that concept because a lot of people that are alive during the era, they are fucking liars. <laughs> and they <laughs> weren't that, anywhere no. significant <laughs> where the shit was being made or experienced. Yeah. And they just say, oh, well, you know, I understand because Biggie came out. And just because they're old enough doesn't mean they was around for shit. Yeah. And it also it's also important to what I'm calling this era of the invisible renaissance. Because mm -hmm. people come after, you know what I'm saying? You know, they, they come with your styles, you know, these he split one word, you know, yeah. like I'm like yeah, shit. There's there's podcast named after the shit that I made up. There's renaissance podcast, wow. you know, in hip hop. Right. The. But they wasn't there when the music was being created. So they don't have the point of contact that I have. Mm -hmm. So it's highlighting that my perspective is going to be unique and worthwhile that no one else can give you. When I go back into music, that means something because when something sounds whack, it's only because my ears evolved. Like, for example, a lot of, a lot of Ted Joa, the, the jazz writer, made a great point that 
people pick kind of blue as a start of classic a lot of times because that's when the development of of, of high fidelity developed mm. so a lot of jazz records that are before in the early 50s don't sound just the quality of it yeah so like let's say i love billy holiday i don't care where it is i play billy holiday but her records you no matter how well they are i see it yeah. i see it <laughs> i love billy holiday yeah, you know man. what i'm saying no matter what records play they don't sound as good quality, like just the quality, not the musicianship. Yeah, no, Mr. Young was on those records, like they're amazing. Yeah. But they don't sound like the way a newer jazz record is. They don't like they don't sound like Herbie Hancock's Headhunters. Right. Right. You know, because he it's 1972. He has shit that to record with that they didn't have back then. James and so Tumi said that same thing yeah. about technology and so the technology changes the way you, you hear the sound too. Yeah. So and then you hear the innovations off the innovations. Mm -hmm. So if I've heard Dizzy Gillespie, if I've heard, uh, um, if I've heard Miles trumpet, if I've heard all these legendary trumpet, Lou Donaldson, all these great trumpet players, when I go back to uh, Louis Armstrong, the sound is dated. Mm -hmm. It's been commercialized. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, people did his techniques or mm -hmm. tried them. So I'm like, the difference that I'm feeling is not that much. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So yeah. I have to put myself back into the position of, yo, wait a minute. Like when you hear Louis Armstrong and they always tell you to go to the hot fives and hot sevens, it's the collection of all the quintets and the septets that he was recording with. And they collected them into the hot fives, hot sevens. That's where people start. Right. And you, I think they have like a best of the hot fives, hot sevens, it's like the best record to start with. Mm -hmm. When you get out of your head with the old style, you're like, yo, this shit sounds crazy. What he was doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right, right. And especially with trumpet, when you go through the trumpet throughout the years of music, it's very little innovation after that. That's mm. how dope he was. Mm. It, it's mind blowing. You know what I'm saying? And mm. that's why, like, you have that trilogy of of Louis, um, uh, Dizzy, and then and, and then um, Miles. And I put Miles in my trilogy because Miles mastered that lower register. Right. So most of the things that the other guys did, he couldn't do, but the lower register he mastered. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, we like we do with singers, right? We might put, you know, I got my favorite is Phyllis Hyman, soul singer. Mm -hmm. But you got Aretha who could do anything, yeah. right? You have others, Gladys Knight, you got all these singers. But Sade, most of the things that they did, she doesn't really do. Right, but she makes that, great music. But that's low register, <laughs> you know what I mean? Making the perfect song, like, mm -hmm. that, that's what she has. Miles is kind of like that as far as trumpet playing. But um, when you look at all these things, Miles Davis has to be appreciated, though, from different eras, you know? So, like, even in my own, I have all of his albums. Like, I'm only missing a few live albums. I have every single album that he has. And I listen to his albums as, like, the jazz era all the way up to In a Silent Way. And then everything else is rock so, punk era. So, with your point of contact not being alive for whenever some of these albums were created, sure, sure. What, what, like, if someone is, you know, wanting to get into the genre why is it important to study the era and study what was going on musically what I while you listen yeah, to the album? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I tell students, right, is I always tell them that you have to build your palate. Mm. And the way you build, you build your palate is by tasting different things. Mm -hmm. You have to get different sounds into you. You have to get all these different things. And our palate, because we're hip-hop, is a lot of funk and a lot of soul. Yeah. You know, so the registers of soul we, we get. But we don't really understand what makes like a, a Billie Holiday or a Ella or those mm. singers special. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I think like, you know, what's funny, right? You don't be a great foray if you did a whole survey of her. Mm. It would really let you understand jazz. Is not Billie or Ella or, or Sarah Vaughan, who's like, they're the trilogy. Right. But my other three favorites. My other three favorites, Dina Washington, Carmen McRae, and... Uh, and um. Nancy Wilson. Okay. I'm on Nancy Wilson. I don't know. I haven't heard right. of anything. With Carmen McRae, I wouldn't put her. Mm -hmm. Use this in this example. But if you wanted to see like a whole spectrum, you would listen to Nancy Wilson or Dina Washington. Mm -hmm. For Dina Washington, the spectrum is a lot of her songs went into pop of that time. Mm -hmm. So in the 40s and 50s, a lot of her songs are, they're all jazz, but they have a heavy rock and roll tinge to them. Mm. 
So you compare and contrast. And when you, when you hear it, you can understand the sensibilities of pop R&B that are creeping into the way she sings. Right. With Nancy Wilson, she just called herself a song stylist because she went from jazz records. And by the 70s, she was doing straight soul records. Right, right. Oh, yeah, for sure. These soul records are not whack. They're, no, they're, they're, they're great, actually. They're, they're inc- <laughs> right? They're incredible. Yeah. It's not like, I'm trying to stay in the game. Let me do one of these, right? right. They're amazing. Well, so, yeah, but isn't that what people are saying about Miles whenever he did Bitches? Right, did? right. Yeah. The thing, the error with Miles is that he's not even doing what Nancy Wilson is doing. Mm-hmm. Doing the genre in a, like her, singing the song of soul, but in her own stylistic way. Mm-hmm. Miles Davis is doing something that doesn't exist in rock. It doesn't exist in jazz. It, it's actually in a complete midpoint. Yeah. And what changes the thing in jazz is that he doesn't have any structure to it. You see mm. what I'm saying? So mm. his rock fusion is very free floating and it's very funky, but it's a sparse funkiness. Right. The right. beat is there, but it may not always be there. You know what I'm saying? And it drifts, it goes out. And everything like that because his own uh, drummers were doing that too mm. so it can't be appreciated if you're looking at funk and, and the thing is jazz musicians don't like funk they don't really appreciate funk whereas miles was was why do, you, why do you think that is i think it's because they stay inside the beat mm-hmm. they stay inside that same beat and mm-hmm. they explore it and they consider it as like there's not much skill level to that Mm. you know what i'm saying which of course you know you and i we obviously disagree yeah. you know what i'm saying but but um a lot of music of our peoples is about repetition i mean mm. that's how we ended up making a breakbeat it was years of repetition right. for the, what the people wanted you know like if you ever hear a merengue song which is really all dancing these songs when you hear them live they go on for 10 minutes and it's amazing i still bug out because the, the hardest the hardest um instrument to play <laughs> the joke is that it's the it's the uh the guido mm. the, scra- the scraper right because it's you gotta do that shit for 10 minutes you imagine doing that shit for 10 minutes <laughs> that's a workout <laughs> yeah it's cramped i'd be cramping up you yeah. know what I mean? yeah it's crazy you know what i mean but the music always has like a certain repetition you mm. know what i'm saying and that's why like uh it was as as a boricua it's very easy to love hip-hop and then go and dig into salsa, merengue, all those groups, because all those sounds, because they have heavy repetition in them. Jazz is the hardest one to get into because it doesn't. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't. Right. It, it revisits rhythms. It revisits things. But it might close out the song and give it cohesion mm-hmm. by revisiting it differently. You know what I'm saying? And mm-hmm. that's what makes Love Supreme so beautiful. Right. Because when he does that in Love Supreme, it the deeper you get into it, it feels like a conversation about love. Thanks. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And it has like a whole story to it. Mm-hmm. And that's why it's classical. Right. Because mm-hmm. the classical has been used to tell a story of that nature. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Whereas one actual jazz song could do it by itself. Yeah. One well, jazz definitely. song can explore the entire realm, you know? And, that and, actually- and that was a thing too, like with the development of like these type of vinyl records, they weren't limited to how long that shit right. was going to be. I'll tell you something as a hip hop listener trying to get into jazz, also listen to it for virtuosity. Mm. The truth is, right? We, you know, like you see people going nuts about Kendrick Lamar's song, which I think is like an exaggeration, you know, like, mm. and not because I'm doing nothing about Kendrick Lamar in this one. Usually yeah, I do. Yeah, I, right? I, I, got you. I know, I know. But it's because in this, again, it's my context. I have all of this yeah. and you're getting excited by an apple and I have the entire fruit basket. Right, right, right. So I'm like, I love apples, but I got Granny Smith. I got this one. <laughs> I got those. I got, you know what I'm saying? I got the, 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 the gala apples. I got all these joints and you're getting hype up one pink lady apple. I'm like, right. I got all of them. Right. So the, the, the problem, when we listen to most hip hop in general, like if you're a hip hop listener and you like all of it, you do f- you you do fall in love and a lot of times listen to hip hop for the virtuosity of it. Just guys throwing techniques out there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know what? Black Thought says a lot of deep shit. But the truth is, if you really love Black Thought, a lot of times you're playing him because you just want to hear the techniques, man. Yeah, facts. You know what facts. I'm saying? Like you want to hear 75 bars. Like, yeah, right? Yeah. There wasn't much 
things going on in that song, but right. man, you know, 75 bars, yeah. right? Yeah. If you get into cannabis, though, come on, you just want to even rock forever, though. Sometimes it could mean something. It could not mean something. It could mm -hmm. just be a gibberish. Right? It doesn't matter. Like, you want to hear the techniques, you know what I'm saying? Big Daddy Kane, right? G-Rap. I want to hear the violence. Right. A lot of times, I just want to hear, like, the way he's doing it. Yeah. Right? If you enjoy jazz in that way, you're going to get into John mm -hmm. Coltrane very quickly. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, you're going to get into a lot of stuff. If you, there's also transitions because, like, I love the entire soul jazz era. Mm. You know what I mean? All those wonderful Blue Note album records. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's a soul sensibility to it because they keep a melody or they riff off a popular melody. Right. And right. then they go in. And um, there, there's, so for real, like, I'm obsessed with uh, organ jazz. I love organ mm. jazz. You know what I'm saying? I don't think I've, and, I don't think I've gotten a, Gotten, uh, gotten there yet. Led by the legend, the legend of the Hammond B3 organ, Jimmy Smith. You mm, know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I have at least 50 albums from Jimmy Smith. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love Jimmy Smith. But I love all types of organ jazz. And mm. from that soul jazz, right, and then into the funk jazz, right, where you're seeing the different levels where people that have gone the whole way, like a Freddie Hubbard who did the jazz records, the hard bop, and then goes into soul jazz and funk jazz, mm -hmm. you start to understand the samples and things like that. Because hip hop doesn't sample a lot of jazz in the hard bop era or earlier because it's not as easy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's easier to sample um, Lonnie Liston Smith. Yeah. You yeah. know, who's got a straight funk break in garden. <laughs> right so the soul jazz would keep like a melody that is a groove mm -hmm. and then they would actually have the solos and the riffing on top of it mm -hmm. that's why i tell you like i love stanley turrentine is my favorite because the music that he actually had is extremely addictive mm. you know what i'm saying that. And i can always get into it whereas when i want to get into the virtuosity of stuff then i'm listening to coltrane yeah but for me personally, this is my own bias. I've always liked the construct construction of a cohesive song. Oh, yeah. You see? Yeah. So oh, that's why if I picked Miles over Coltrane, that's why. Because well, Miles always seemed to have like a cohesive song to it. I think know? that's why I choose Coltrane over Miles is because if the first time hearing a Coltrane record, you don't know where it's going. <laughs> right <laughs> and if, yeah and for for many the enjoyment of music is that unpredictability yeah. of music you know yeah. what i'm saying mm -hmm. and just like in hip-hop a lot of the legends it's the unpredictability of where they're going you know for a lot of us though right when we were hearing those wu-tang records we didn't know what they're gonna say we didn't even know who's gonna be on that joint. right and you didn't know how <laughs> right. they would be on it like mm -hmm. the excitement of that is kind of the same yeah. you know what i'm saying and, and, and it's all of that, you know what I'm saying? But then some of us would like that steadiness of depth to it. Yeah. And so we might get into Jizza. Yeah. You might get into this, you know, you might get into the, the character of it, you know? So it's jazz has all of these worlds. And the ethos of jazz is a route to hip hop mm. because the ethos of jazz, and Ralph Ellison to me explained this best, actually. He said, the jazz musician learns the instrument, but he's not a jazz musician yet. Mm. It is when he plays that, that instrument in his own unique way after learning the instrument properly that he's a jazz musician. Wow. And that's, that had to have filtered into hip hop because it, it, had, it went into all the other genres. You know what I'm saying? Because when you look at all the black music, what's the, one of the most beautiful principles of our people is that despite making music for money, and that has ruined so much of it. Yeah there's still among so many of the great musicians this drive to daringly do something different because others are doing something else. Right, most definitely. And, and, and if that still takes place and they still daringly do that at risk of livelihood, yeah. it, it, I find it to be an amazing thing. Uh, yeah. Wow, you know what I'm saying? A, yeah, I, I totally agree, God. It, it you know? kind of made me think about something too, like as far as the connections between jazz and hip hop. You know how, like, uh, obviously battling in hip-hop is, you know, from the beginning, whether it's been on <laughs> wax or what we have now. Yeah. But, like, I've read stories where young up-and-coming jazz musicians will go to a, a jazz club while somebody's playing and they start yeah. playing and cut them. That's the tradition of Black music. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, the famous Robert Johnson 
sucked. Yeah. And then he disappeared and came and back. Came back. With the <laughs> seventh string guitar. And it was like, yo, he got the God strings. Like yeah. nobody had the God yeah. strings. You know what I mean? Like, and, and then he was killing it. Charlie Parker was whack. Mm. He's out in Kansas City. Kansas City developed a style where even the ballads started to pop off there. Mm -hmm. So they had a more intricate lyrical style that was developing. He was whack. Wow. He goes and he trains and he comes back and says, yo, look at me now. Yeah, yeah. Whereas yeah. then you get, it, and it's funny because it's totally different culture. And Coltrane seems to have gone into the, he wasn't as good. But the Coltrane that became, kind of also became because he wasn't as good as he wanted to be. But then it became more of an obsession. Yeah. That there's something that he's trying to say and can't say it. Right, right. That shit is nuts to me. Yeah, it is. And I think that <laughs> if hip hop could let loose, that's why I love this era, because you can make your own music. Mm -hmm. And when I hear people like, like, you know who I think about this a lot? Esty Knack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Al Davino a lot of times too. Artists like that. Sometimes Mac Hami too. Mm -hmm. You know, people like this. They seem to just be rhyming to explore where they can go with it. And they don't know where they could go with it. Yeah. And so these records become jazz sessions. And when I propose it to them, especially SD Neck, he's like, yeah, these are like, like that because we're going to do whatever we feel like at that moment. Right. Being and able to capture that To that moment. Even when I that. talk to people that like, oh, that sounds like ideal today's boom bap, like a starving bee. Even he'll tell me, well, these records are a moment of time. Yeah. And so I can't make those records again, even though they, you, you want to hear that again. Mm. I made that then, and I wouldn't have made that again now. You right. know what I mean? Right. Even though, for some people, the music would sound generally similar. But isn't that true that a lot of jazz musicians, like, their biggest records, they didn't like to play that shit in the club? No, no. You know what I'm saying? And, like, look at Miles is the best example. You know, Miles didn't play any of his ballads after a certain year. Mm. You know? And I think that also led to people, because, you know, people, they want to hear the hits and yeah. become popular. I can't front, God. If it was like if I was almost there and I was late and I went there and I didn't get to hear Blue and Green, I'd yeah, be I'd be mad. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be tight. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like if somebody you like now you pay a ton of money. Like if I go, if I take like the most gorgeous woman to go see Shad Day and Shad Day don't play certain joints, like yeah. if she don't play no ordinary love, yeah. like, <laughs> I'm glad God, you like you know. know. You know, I, I I saw Anita Baker. She played You Bring Me Joy for me. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she did it for me. So, like, you know. Yeah, you, saw, you saw Anita? That's she. Oh, I did. Oh, man. Oh, that, one of my all-time favorite Yeah, she's mine, too. Yeah, I love Anita. You know what I mean? To me, it's Phyllis, Phyllis and Anita. They're, they're, they're my favorites. You know, Sade. Uh, you know, of course, Aretha. You know what yeah. I'm saying? When it comes to jazz, you know, there's obviously hella books, hella documentaries. Oh, and one of, the, one of the most famous ones is uh, Ken Burns. Ken Burns, and yeah. What, was your, what, what are your thoughts on that documentary? When that came out, there wasn't much to study. Mm. So I actually watched them on TV and shit because I was really trying to learn. And I learned a lot. You know what I'm saying? But I also thought that, like, the white musicians, which were dope, he put extra emphasis on them way too much. Yeah. So Bix Biederberg is great. He actually helped innovate the ballads and I, I love ballads of all mm -hmm. types. I'm a balladeer, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And um, I got my own jazz ballads playlist. I have my own soul, <laughs> soul section playlist. Like Dope. I collect ballads and I extract it. I even have bolero songs that are just mm. awesome. I love them. But they went OD going into his whole life and everything like that. And they didn't do it that way for others that I felt should have. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I think one of the problems was is he tried to show how it's an American yep. music. Yep. And they reiterated that all throughout. All the, the time. And I was like, I rolled my eyes every time because I'm like, here's why, right? As a Boricua learning it later, not then. Mm -hmm. There's almost no real coverage of the importance of Puerto Rican and Cuban musicians that develop Latin jazz. Yep. The, so I mean, is, especially then. Right. There's this some there's the, some documentaries now. This um, isn't like um in the Ken Burns jazz series, which is mad long, it isn't like he left out someone that was influenced by like certain little 
bits of Jewish music, like a Benny Goodman might be, mm-hmm. or somebody else that was in uh, uh, um, Italian uh, Moorish music influenced certain musicians. Like a lot of stuff, you know, you could do anything with jazz, right? But these musicians changed bebop, mm, right? And they changed one of the one of the goats, God. Like if you're collecting musical catalogs, Parker and, and, and Dizzy are where you got it. You have to have a Dizzy and Bird collection. Yes. If you're collecting and you're saying, my collection is good. Even if you don't like those errors the best, you have to have those errors in there. Right. You got to have them in there. And I, I love, especially Dizzy's uh, uh, um, catalog because it extended. He, he obviously didn't die at 34. And um, when Dizzy Gillespie encounters Mario Bausa and the other Latin musicians, they're showing him polyrhythms of exploration that he could do with the drums. Mm. And that leads to seminal songs like Manteca, um, like Salt Peanuts. Like a lot of people hear yeah, Salt, salt Peanuts. peanuts. Go, yeah, salt yeah, Peanuts, that's... Salt Peanuts. When yeah. you go Salt Peanuts, that did it, that did it. People are like, yeah, whatever. Okay. But when you go to, now when you go back to Latin music, do you realize that you can hear the most cr- song that has nothing to do with like that era or could be about girls or could be about anything you'll hear odes to salt peanuts thrown in there wow so like a a, a salsa song and like and like yo what the does that have to do (laughs) no (laughs) with the whole orchestration we were just hearing here yeah yeah yeah, and i'm like i'm like the only guy going oh shit he put salt peanuts in there wow you know what i'm saying wow and and so the the (laughs) the integration there was key because what it allowed it to do was it allowed the big band era for, 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 for Latin music, song music to be able to explore. And that's where you get like people like Tito Puente Mm -hmm. because his band is able to explore and go through massive solos from the drum for, you know, like he has whole, um, my favorite, Tito album is really like a jazz is really a jazz album mm-hmm. um what is it called it's Puente in percussion okay oh god there's no vocals there's no horn section there's no piano there's only drums are you it's, serious there's only drums god wow I'm gonna listen to that tonight god. oh god this is a record yeah I'm gonna listen to that tonight it's called to, uh Tito Tito Puente what is it called Puente, Puente in percussion 1955, 1955. Yo, God, when I used to play this, when I was when I was a teen and play this, blast this record, it was the same as if I was playing hip hop with curses. Wow. There was my old earth I'm like, Kita <laughs> ese It's funny. I used to laugh at her because she used to call it. It's totally made up word. She used to go boom boom now, and I was like, "Yo, that's what it is. It's boom bap. It's boom yeah, bap." Yeah, exactly. Uh, don't don't. <laughs> you know, so she actually invented the term boom bap before boom. Yeah. Bap. <laughs> you know, yo, and um, yo, it's crazy. I think it was like Puente on Team Balas. Is he was always on Team Balas, and I think it was Willie Bobo on on Gongas, and it was somebody else. Ooh, legends, God. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they were just riffing off each other, and it was basically a jam session, and it's. It extended son. In son music, you have the different tempos. One of the tempos is called descalga. And descalga just means literally jam. Mm, so like a jam session. Yeah. So a jam session is part of the actual repertoires of son. Mm. As it develops over the years, it develops into salsa because the, 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 band, had, the band takes deliberate and syncopated solos that become very extended and unpredictable but also because the lyrics change. Right, right. So salsa lyrics actually are more battle-driven and they also talk about like what's happening. So it, you people argue whether salsa is a subgenre or a genre. You know what I'm saying? It's mm-hmm. hard to argue. People from Cuba, where song comes from, they'll argue all day and say salsa just like whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But the reason salsa is a genre, just to, to add on, salsa, like jazz, is able to, and does this deliberately, it's able to infuse other genres. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Willie Colon is probably the most famous for that. So he's able to infuse bomba, cumbia from, you know, cumbia and all these other different African rhythms mm-hmm. and the other Puerto Rican genres, like hibaro music and things like that, and inject them in there and it worked. That's wow. something Stone doesn't do. So 
that only comes about because there's a jazz ethos. You know what right. I mean? Right. And that's not even in the, the documentary. It's not in there. It's like it's not it, in there at all, God. You know, and I'm like, you missed the whole thing because it's a big part of Dizzy's repertoire. Yeah. You know, when you say Dizzy's top 10 classics, there's no way Manteca, Afro Blue, uh, uh, Salt Peanuts, like these are all percussive works that mm -hmm. are crucial. You know, this isn't like a, it led to all these offshoots, but it's crucial to the way the jazz explores because it, it anything that extends jazz and, and lets the other instruments not just be a, a background mm -hmm. and lets them explore is monumental. You know, yeah, most definitely. And, and, and yeah. well said, God. And so I just have one last thing to ask you. You know, we've been building for a minute. I yeah, always yeah. appreciate these conversations. Totally. But, you know, we both we both have, you know, we both militant. Right. And <laughs> and um, when it comes to jazz it, uh, for, you know, in a lot of cases, whether it was, uh, you know, them coming after um, uh uh, Billy Holiday, or mm -hmm. or you know, um, the, we know the whole story about Rifa right. and Harry Anslinger, and how you know he said jazz was making. Right. Yeah, we ain't got to get into it, right? But how how can music and you know, obviously, Billy uh, Billy uh, Holiday, Strange Fruit, Strange Fruit had words, but but other than sure, that, sure. how can music be considered revolutionary? without without having any words uh, lyrics you know yeah. what I mean? the truth is is that music um it, you know throughout history it's not really the mu the lyrics that are revolutionary mm. it's always it's usually the music it's us mm. we're backwards we go music like when mm -hmm. people say hip-hop isn't really music and the sampling things i think that they're focusing on the creation of the composition right? Notes, original notes that you change or bend mm -hmm. and go into new notes, right? And, and you can write it out if you look back. With hip-hop, it's really about the arrangements, right? But the real innovation is the last instrument, mm. the MC. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's what becomes militant. Now, it's the point of contact. We have to try to get into the head of what it was like back then. Mm -hmm. The biggest reason, if I took all of jazz in one fell swoop, right? The genius of the black mind to create music is something that was not afforded to us. Mm. After a while, God, after, especially once Duke Ellington exists, mm -hmm. now white people have to look at black people and say, this is not all instincts, like mm. animals with their drums. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. Like, like monkeys that fashion tools to break open coconuts. You know right. what I'm saying? Right, right. They have limited intelligence by instinct. Now, after this happens, now the black man is seen as a thinking creative mm. mind. Mm. Not just a raw creative instinctive presence. You know, oh, he plays so good. Oh, he just hits it. Look at sports, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're never seen as cerebral. We yeah. only could see, obviously, we have to admit that people like Larry Bird are cerebral because he has horrible athleticism for what <laughs> right. he was doing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. right. <laughs> but people were never seeing, like, for a long time, it really only the last three championship years of Jordan that people started to really appreciate that Jordan has real a real cerebral mind. Mm, right. You know what I'm saying? Because he was so athletic in the right. beginning. Right. You know what I'm saying? And um, when you started to hear jazz, after a while, it's like, yo, these are real composers. And in American music, they're not composing music on that level. Mm. They're writing songs at that level, mm -hmm. right? Look at, they're writing songs on that level, right? Mm -hmm. And then even jazz fucks it up because mm -hmm. Ella Fitzgerald takes all of the songbooks of all of the composers and sings them in jazz. Damn. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, the Jerome Kersey, the the all of these song books that that she did. She did about what 10, 12 composers, you know, Irving Berlin. And so you're seeing all of these, you know, uh, at the Ritz and shit, and yeah. Ella, Ella's singing them. And I have all the song books, God. They're amazing. Wow. They're amazing. I, of course, you got all and, of them. <laughs> but the reason I mentioned Duke is there's one song book mm -hmm. that isn't a composer that's out that's jazz, and that's Duke Ellington's songbook. 
Wow. He said, you know what? You're going to come and do my songs. Mm. Like in a sentimental mood, which if I named one Maybe song, should, my yeah. favorite jazz song of all time. Yeah, I, I can't blame you. Yeah. It's in a sentimental mood. Yeah. I love almost every version of it from Phyllis Hyman all the way to Duke and John Coltrane's version. Yeah, you know I mean? my favorite is Duke and, and Coltrane. But yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. just unbelievable. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, I think that's why. And when you see people like Miles Davis, mm-hmm. right? It shows the it, it, he was his confrontation to them is like I don't need your approval to fuel me to create. Mm. Now it's even more kick in the face because not only can he make things that didn't exist before, so now a uh, Duke Ellington isn't a one trick pony. Master composer is not one trick. Mm. It's right. filled with these composers, right? You know what I mean? It's filled with composers. Thelonious Monk was original compositions. Charles Mingus with his original compositions. It's filled with them. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's always about the, the black body, but in this case, the black mind. Mm. We're not just virtuoso playing, playing for 20 minutes straight. He could compose something that may be one of the most beautiful pieces of music ever made. Something that hangs with the most beautiful classical pieces that you'll hear, the most, the most beautiful sung pieces you hear. It's there. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Right. And I but, think that's to me very, very rebellious and very yeah. revolutionary. That's and it bothers people. It bothers people that when we talk about American music, the greatest compositions of the entire recorded era in the entire world belong to black folk. Mm. Right. In other words, we can say that everyone has added on, but they haven't composed in that way. Wow. And that's saying a lot. You and know, that's saying a would, lot. Would you say, like, and jazz's constant need to push the boundaries was also seen as being rebellious? Because, you know, I read, like, um, like you know, during the ragtime era where right. it came from, like, right after the Civil War, where the Civil War bands were, burr, 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 and, right, bands, right. and then right yeah. after that, they started taking if that shit think, somewhere else. If you think about it, every single era of jazz comes with its accompanying, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. And if you could yeah, figure yeah. out that what the fuck moment <laughs> when people heard it, then right. you're like, these guys are going off. And I always mention Miles because he did it very overtly. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. He did it very overtly. So people are like, man, we just got into this. You know, like it takes the crossover white audience a long time to catch up. And then when they catch up, you say, listen, I'm not doing that no more. Yeah, that shit whack now. <laughs> very, very frustrating. Yeah. Because with jazz, it's a slow, le- it was a slow learning curve. It took mm-hmm. them years. Mm-hmm. The only reason we have a fast learning curve with music, where we get like good MCs, mm-hmm. is because our music gets diluted at a faster pace. Yeah. And so it's easier for people to do the good versions faster. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Nothing got diluted as quick as hip hop. You know, I mean, they right. commercialized that at light speed compared to jazz. Yeah. With jazz, they were like, I, I don't know what they do. <laughs> I can't yeah, right, do right, right, right. <laughs> right? <laughs> true, true. And then when they figured it out, like, let's make a swinging band. Dit, dit, yeah. And let's try to dance like <laughs> that. Some, then and they do get shit. Charlie Parker and everything playing it at even faster speeds. Where at the time when they said they called it, they called themselves called it the new jazz. Like the mm. new jazz. And they were playing it with like, where people say, like, when they try to explain it to, like, you know, like, really white people and stuff, they say, what's the difference between bebop and jazz before? They say jazz that you can't dance to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've, you know what? It I want to say I've heard that. I've heard that. Actually. Yeah. And that, God, that's not a saying that works with us. Mm. We could dance to anything. Yeah. Because if you change the way a beat sounds, we do something else. Yeah. You that, know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's not really something that affords to us. But that obsession with the same, you know what I mean, is always an addiction. Mm-hmm. So it goes back to that addiction. And that's why the jazz has to offshoot it to other things like funk, uh, R&B, soul, you know, and even hip hop. If you notice, all the offshoots that come out of jazz are rooted. Every single offshoot needs a, a break. The original term break meant the moment the jazz soloist would come on. Wow. For every music coming out of jazz. Mm-hmm. Or being an alternative to jazz, the break is when we repeat something to our delight yeah. endlessly. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And a lot of our other black musics, we need that mm-hmm. for people that have to sell their music. 
they've needed to have a break, something mm-hmm. that repeats because people can't always follow something that changes all the time. Yeah, right. You know what right, I'm saying? Right. And so jazz is like, it's, it's literature of music. Mm. You know what I'm saying? It's a literature of music. And some of it is easy to follow. Some of it gives you a steady backbeat. Like, that's why I love soul jazz so much, right? And you mm-hmm. can get pieces of it. Some of them is all the way. Like a lot of Sonny Rollins, one of my favorite sax man. Mm-hmm. When what he did with Alfie and others, I was saying like you have yeah, movies, that was, yeah, that's an amazing album. challenging yeah. music, and that was for a movie that I had to see it. My brother made me watch it, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I was totally bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the movie, you yeah, know what I mean? Because yeah. he made me see it at the time when he was very refined with his film watching, and I was definitely not. Right, you know what I'm saying? Where and where I was musically refined. And so we were at the opposite peaks, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Now, as older men, we appreciate each other's, you know, uh, depth uh, uh, of expertise of, of expertise on each mm-hmm. level. But um, it, it's so it, it was it's so rebellious, you know what I mean? I think the one thing that jazz missed is the only thing is the thing that jazz, that hip hop got because we have hip hop. Mm. And what is it? We have the MC. Mm. We have explored the vocal instrument in ways that no no other genre can do you know what i mean no and, doubt um, well god i appreciate you for coming let, back to the show lord yeah indeed I, i'd love to let let everybody go with like some list i mean yeah 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 like, yeah yeah you know yeah what's um, the well yeah what you know i um, had i had my favorite my five i had my favorite five records to start with mm-hmm. right and then I had like a Miles and Coltrane list because you you love Miles and Coltrane. Yeah, facts. You know, the singers, I love the singers, by the way. Mm-hmm. And I said it was Ella, Billy, Sarah, right? Mm-hmm. Um, with them, start with Ella, start, go with any of the songbooks, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Billy, um, you go with the Columbia recordings. They set them into volumes, right? Mm-hmm. With Sarah Vaughan, you start with the record I'm going to mention in the favorites, right? Um, and then anything else you get your hands on, yeah. you know, yeah. Nancy Wilson, she made like a lot of albums. I could never choose which one because there's so many different eras and stuff. You know what I mean? Dina has like a great collection. Carmen McRae, the same. There are great collections to go into it with. Um, but singers, though, and it sounds kind of like rebellious here or, or out of the box. But if you go into jazz singers, the one that goes into jazz, but was always known as like a pop singer or the popular music, but really his best ethos in all of his songs has jazz in it, is Frank Sinatra. Wow. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And to me, Frank Sinatra is the most prolific singer in American history. Wow. The most prolific, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because his peak is longer, in a longer recorded amount than anybody else. Extremely long. You know what I mean? And that's because he loved the studio. Mm-hmm. And because when he was at Columbia, that's when they invented the LP. Wow. And so he loved to go in there and record, you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. And um, I love Frank Sinatra. You know, his music is great. You know what I mean? Especially from like the 50s all the way to like the, to the 60s. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, but the five records that to get you into jazz, I had obviously the two we talked about. Kind of Blue, Miles, 1959, 1965, Love Supreme, John Coltrane. To get you into vocal jazz, I put Sarah Vaughan's featuring Clifford Brown. You know what I mean? 1954. It's a perfect record of the synergy of a great lead uh, instrumentalist and a lead vocalist and the interaction between them. Because Clifford Brown was one of the great trumpet players, but he died very young, yeah. even younger than uh, uh, Bird. He died yeah. in, like in his 20s in a car accident, you know, so mm. it wasn't even drugs or anything. So it was really tragic. Yeah. Then I picked something different because I'm obsessed with it. And it's also a feat in jazz uh recording in other words using your recording equipment and splicing things together and arrangements mm. to make a jazz record and that's charles mingus's the black saint and the sinner lady yeah i've, I've heard that out it's such an Straight exciting uh, it's such an exciting album it's my favorite mingus record even mm. though i love all the mingus records you know what i mean all these people i love yeah. um i was gonna put um a Thelonious Monk record but I mentioned Brilliant Corners mm-hmm. but instead for my number and so that's a given that's a, a bonus but I had to put my foray into my love into organ jazz organ jazz so I had to put Jimmy Smith's back at the chicken shack 
All right, hold on. Got to write that one down. Yeah, you got to <laughs> you got to go into Jimmy Jimmy Smith back at the chicken shack. You know what I mean? Right. On the sunny side of the street. You know, people say when they always ask questions on Twitter, like what record you play when you want to feel good or like, yeah. happy. Yeah. For some reason on the sunny side of the street makes me feel happy. I bet. You know I, <laughs> love, I love that record. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But I'm obsessed with soul jazz. I, I went with organ jazz, especially, you know what I mean? Because with organ jazz, you see the real explorations of the organ and the guitar. Mm, right. Like, like Grant Green, Kenny Burrell, legends. You know what I mean? West Montgomery. West, oh, West Montgomery. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Those three are my favorite. And you don't see that exploration. Until, and of course, you got to add in my man, George Benson. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. George yeah. Benson. You know what I mean? But um, those five, if you start with those five, it leads you to great jazz and you can shoot off from there. If I had to pick five Coltrane records to start with, I would pick Love Supreme, of course. I would dive into another one of the classic um, vocalist highlighted instrumentalist albums. And it's just simply called John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I've recently got put on to that. That's a dope Johnny, album. Johnny Hartman, a lot of people don't know because Johnny Hartman had the buh, 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 like that kind of voice. Like he was <laughs> yeah. like, all, all that old school stuff. And he sang everything like that. And the peak is, is that he has Coltrane at his best balladeer level. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This is for the brothers when you get that lady alone mm -hmm. and you're trying to talk to her and really be serious with her and shit mm. like that. This is it. Yeah. It, you know what I mean? I don't even know why people are playing hip hop. That's the yeah, other stuff. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'll be putting on hell on earth when it's time to talk to you. Know I mean? <laughs> All right. <laughs> right? <Got you>. <laughs> Johnny, John Coltrane and, and Johnny Hartman. You know what I'm saying? Come mm -hmm. on. Don't, don't screw this up. You know what I mean? Um, Duke Ellington and John Coltrane album, 1962. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Of course, album. I love that album because all the songs, but of course, from Sets one of the them. Mood. In a sentimental mood, I feel like instrumentally, because vocally there's so many of them, but instrumentally, that's to me the best one. Mm, mm. And that's saying a lot because if you ever collect Do, he has so many dope versions of that song. It's, mm. it's, it's so much fun. To, that's the thing about jazz. You can't really just delete and say, oh, I have that song already. Let me delete it. They'll all be different. Yeah. yeah. They'll all be different. So you can't really delete them. You right, know what I mean? Right. And um, the fourth one, I said, I said, Blue Train, 19. Yes, love that album. A lot of people love that. Jay Live did like the same type of cover for all of the above. His best yep. album to me. Yep. Um, his classic, one of his classic albums to me. Um, and Blue Train is just like, yo, that's the intensity of the music. You know what I mean? The, 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 the bop, the hard bop, you know? It's a great record. Um, my favorite things, 1960. That album I put because it has a beautiful ballad on it, but it also has my, one of my favorite Coltrane songs that isn't on Love Supreme, and that's the title track, My Favorite Things. Mm. You know, so when people be like, oh, play Christmas music, I always fuck them up and I put my favorite things. <laughs> right. You know? And um, I think um, Juggernaut sampled that, you know, Breezley Bruin. Mm. But did it, did it, did it. Mm. Like right. the beginning of that is so hard, but it comes in hard mm -hmm. and hip hop shit. It's yeah, rugged. that's what we do. Then for like the details of what Coltrane was doing, you got to listen to Giant Steps, 1960. Yep. It's a great record. It's a great record with Naima and all these other beautiful songs. There's so many Coltrane records. I didn't even add, he did a lot of duo albums. Like he, I love the John Coltrane album he did just with Monk too. Mm -hmm. It's called Coltrane and Monk. You know I haven't I mean? heard that yet. That one's dope too. You'll love I, it. You'll yeah. love it. You know? And my Miles Davis records. This one, it was hard because I love all of them. You know what I'm saying? But uh, I, if you're collecting, you start with Kind of Blue. I would say Sketches of Spain. Mm -hmm. Porgy and Bess. Very underrated classic, though, but it's beautifully musically. Um, Bitches Brew. Mm. Why did I put Bitches Brew? Like, if you ordered them, I put Bitches Brew 4 because if you're collecting, I think you need to understand what Miles was doing before you see him explore. Agreed. Because I had bought Bitches Brew set like very early. Me you too. Know? And I did not get it. I right. didn't get it. They always say kind of blue and they go, what are, what are his other classics? Bitches Brew. Exactly. And you, <laughs> like, you want to buy it because the cover is fucking fire. Fire. 
so what could go wrong here yeah and you're listening to it and except for like there's a sample in there that fat joe diamond d used for fat joe on the fat joe album no <laughs> that was about it i didn't understand the record yeah me neither i didn't get it i was thinking i was going to hear something like the uh right like the blue or something yeah I like, and i was nah, like well, these songs have no i don't you don't understand the progression where it's going i was yeah. like you know what i mean it's crazy and then um also go for like his his mastery of bop and like the swing that he had miles ahead mm. there's others like milestones stuff but i love miles ahead mm -hmm. that album cover too he had a like a a, a pretty white girl on a sailboat on it mm -hmm. and he was like why you always put he told the label <laughs> why you always put the white, white bitches on my album yeah, covers on that i saw that you know yeah. and then they put the dope cover of him playing the trumpet yeah 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 <laughs> miles, like, yeah, miles, miles is a motherfucker yeah. <laughs> i love miles man yeah. and um I've always personally loved in a silent way. So it's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. But I think that Miles Davis innovates a lot of the techniques of sampling mm -hmm. by sampling himself. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when he takes bits and pieces of a whole hour that they were recording, he's splicing and putting together. It's a lot like Black Saint and the Sinner Lady in many ways. But Miles Davis would also sample types of progressions. That's what Sketches of Spain is. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean there's so much things that hip hop was already doing, you know what I'm saying? So I would start with those records and you can't go wrong with, with yeah. any of the other and records. And explore. Once you got those, explore, right? To explore, man, because yeah. it, it's going to be fun, you know, because yeah. once you understand those, and I think you shouldn't, a, a collector shouldn't explore, actually, Miles Davis rock funk era if they don't know, a, they'll help themselves with a good funk collection mm -hmm. and also a, a good rock collection. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you haven't heard and understood how blues is so deliberately made into funk, then and understand what Led Zeppelin was doing. Mm, that's exactly that's the first group that came to mind too. Yeah, hear the Rolling Stones, hear the Beatles and shit like that. You might not like all of that shit, which mm -hmm. I find it hard if you wouldn't like Led Zeppelin. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Right, right. But if you want to understand the exploration that people are doing, like you have to listen, listen to Pink Floyd's The Wall, shit like that. Yeah. Because in that time, album rock became a thing where you make whole albums. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And there weren't many black, black our people weren't doing that. And that's why um, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On is so important. Yeah. Because it led, it led to making albums. Yeah. Cohesive statements over a course of a time Thanks. with songs. And that's what led, you know, that's where you get the uh, Stevie Wonder's whole legacy begins because he sees that and he's like, yo, I can make these whole joints. That's why you see such a jump. One of the best ever. Yeah. Then now you see these albums that are like, yo, masterpieces. Yeah, it's crazy that Barry Gordy wasn't even feeling that shit at first. He's fucking, like, fucking front. Yeah. It, there's only front worse than that is Funk Master Flex, not like it protect your neck, you know? Ah, right? yeah, that shit. Bitch, Wait, yeah. hold on. What? He said that? Ah, oh, come on, man. He did not he, like it. And he just oh, played it because you know, <laughs> how off are you gonna be for that? Yeah, I don't, yeah, that's crazy. That's the, <laughs> I ain't never heard no shit like <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> that's so uh, that was a no-brainer. I was like, yo, it's yeah. a fucking no-brainer. Right, like, right. If there's shit, ever a no-brainer, that shit is a no-brainer. You know no what I'm saying? You didn't like that record? Like there's nothing like that at the time. Nothing. And nothing. it was just as everything that we wanted, you know. Mm. At the time, people wanted shit more hardcore, you know. Yeah. And, and then they gave crazy you crazy kung fu movie shit in there. Yeah. Like, nah, we ain't. It was like everything you wanted records. Yeah, exactly. Were tougher, you know? Yeah. And it he gave you the toughest record, you know? And yeah. then you, you were like, I shouldn't play this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking yeah, crazy. Nah. Yeah, jazz, man. It's a deep fucking world, man. Deep world, it's God. A, that's what I was saying. This shit could go on for like more, yeah, like two you know? more hours. And, you and know I, I, I think that when music, when listeners, one thing I find about hip hop listeners, because I obviously, I, I have to try to see what I'm trying to explain to people. And what I find most though is that hip hop listeners, like a real good hip hop, I'm not talking about like pop listeners and shit like that. Um, they don't listen to that much music aside mm -hmm. from hip hop. Yeah, I know. Because, I can't because I don't there understand are it. Hundreds of hip hop albums coming out, you theoretically could just listen to hip hop. Yeah, but and have new shit all the time. And I'm like, it makes you be such a bad um listener, like your your ears are gonna be so maladapted. It, mm -hmm. It's like eating the same type of food. Yeah. I, I don't understand how people could do it. it. It wouldn't be like eating the same type of food. It would be like eating only fruits or only vegetables or right. only grains. You know what I mean? But um, jazz is the perfect place to explore. And I think hip-hop 
listeners, but also musicians have to start delving into those crates. Because, you know, a lot of the classics that we love, mm -hmm. they're not really sampling much jazz. They're sampling soul jazz. Yeah. But like Diggable Planet's blog home is mainly soul jazz. Mm, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Like Bobby like Humphrey. Like you said, it's probably hard to sample jazz, a jazz because record. Because you're not getting a groove out of the jazz. Right. So if you're sampling it, you've already got to have a groove, and now you're looking for musical accompaniment. Yeah. Yeah, so the yeah. easiest way to find a groove is in there. And remember, you had limited material to chop up. But now with so much technology, you could actually dig in the crates in a more advanced level. Right. You know, yeah. you could add the amount of tracks. You're not limited to like the 90s where like they just had this little piece of, you know, that, that they're just looping and eight seconds of sampler. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, you know, that would take forever to make a beat, you know? No doubt. So you're just digging for the real quality. but there's so much in between and shit. And, and of course, there are classics that do sample jazz straight up. Like, you know, like uh, Right Back At You, mm -hmm. Bob Deep. Yeah. That shit is so rugged with the piano. But that's less, that's, uh, if I remember, Les McCann. Fucking mm. fire. Yeah, yeah. Fucking fire. You know what I mean? I was digging in the crates for that one, huh? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Crates. You know? And I could tell, I could, it's not snitching because that great British snitch site. Uh, yeah, Sam, I hate that already, shit. Yeah. They already, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> they already gave it up. So they, you know, they sample it. snitching like a motherfucker now too. Yeah, and it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help because a lot of people make music now and they don't have to worry about samples and shit like that, right? Yeah, Sample yeah. clearance, and it's great. But if you keep on with the snitching, somebody's gonna try to make an app or some kind of way because they already make Shazam is already an app where you could it could register recorded music. So if yeah. you play, if someone's playing the movie, you're like what is that bullshit? Mm. I do that all the time. I'm sorry. Yeah. Like somebody's playing some trap shit I hear. It's like, what is this <laughs> bullshit called? And I that shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um they could also do that. And when that when that technology becomes even more refined, they'll be able to what capture songs at a more mm -hmm. smaller amount. Like yeah. the Shazam, these apps now, you need to play like a significant amount, yeah. like a, a minute or, or a 45 to a minute. But what happens if it could loop like just a few seconds? Yeah. give you possibilities yeah they're gonna make that soon enough so this snitching yeah. is not like it's not where it's at you know what i'm saying real shit you know it's enough that we have such bad musicianship that came about from people ditching sampling way too soon mm. you know what I'm saying yeah because i don't want to hear more whip that trick you know <laughs> god i'm gonna have to end i'm gonna have to end it on that note lord <laughs> yeah um, i talk about jazz all and music all and all that yeah me but, too god but oh, I, I, I i sincerely appreciate you for coming through lord oh, absolutely and, such a great topic you know what i'm saying uh yeah it's yeah, great this, this part, I hope that we, people gotta, that, we gotta do a part two yeah bro. indeed i hope that people that that are trying to get into jazz and love hip-hop that they have the good segues to stuff that w they would probably like you know what i'm saying most definitely. Well, your expertise is always appreciated, Lord. I'm oh, signing man. out. You have a good one, God. Indeed, God. And you're doing a great thing with what you're doing, God. So many minds, the mm. cataloging stuff that needs to be cataloged. You know what I mean? I appreciate you, Lord. Absolutely, God. Peace to the God. Peace, God.